Hello and welcome to Cinema Savvy and welcome to a brand new movie route. It's myself, George, tonight joined by Chris and I am doing the intro for a change. Uh, we've kind of put each other on the spot. We're going to have a quick roll reversal. Uh, we haven't switched our cameras around though, so it's, there's a bit of a difference <laughs> here, but we are back for another review. We have been very fortunate to be given a press screener for the brand new release, Judas and the Black Messiah, which is coming out this Friday, the 12th of February in the United States. And we believe Friday the 26th of February here in the UK. You may be wondering, saying, well, how are we going to be able to watch it then? Well, this is an Oscar film. So if you haven't heard of this film by now, there's been a lot of traction with this. It was one of those films that was delayed by the coronavirus pandemic, as they all have. This was due to come out in August last year. It recently premiered at Sundance in America. So they're starting the press run and we're starting to see lots more about it. And there is actually a couple of comments to be made about another Oscar film this year, which crosses over uh, kind of similarly. It would have been like having Rocket Man and uh, Bohemian Rhapsody come out in the same year. They didn't, but uh, there's some character crossovers for sure. However, this isn't about music. This is about something completely different. Uh, this is a Fred Hampton biopic for those that aren't familiar. Fred Hampton was one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party in the 1960s, uh, who was tragically, well, I, we can say assassinated now. Back then it was uh, it was something else, but the, the formal term is assassination in 2021. And uh, this, this film covers that. And if you think I've spoiled it, um, you can probably tell by the title, uh, Judas <laughs> and the Black Messiah. Um so yeah, uh, before we get into it, I'm going to hand it over to Chris to the socials. Yes, yeah, so um, this is this is new for me as well, doing the socials. But uh, it's nice to get new movies for a change, uh, especially Oscar ones. We are kind of slowly ramping into that season where we're going to be watching films left, right and centre. Um, and the best way to follow us is obviously on our social medias where we might have a last minute review like this if we get an early screener for a film. Um, we tend to be pretty sporadic with our videos. So we've got Facebook at Cinema Savvy, Twitter at Cinema underscore Savvy. And of course, I'm wearing a T-shirt, Cinema Savvy. Uh, you can find the public link in the description down below if you want to check out some of our merch as well. Um, so we can't say, um, you know, offer what your opinions are on this film because it is an early screener that we've got. But um, I think this is going to be a big one this Oscar season. There's already a lot of talk about it at the moment. I think mostly down to the... Um, the actors in it and the uh, performances um we probably will compare it to trial of chicago 7 at some point i definitely think that this was a better film and i had more of, this film had more of an impact on me than trial of chicago 7 did um but i want to try and review this film on its merits as well so this was directed by shaka king and i did check his credits and it looks like besides a few episodes of tv i think this might be his first sort of big film that is directed uh, and I did a little bit of digging on the film as well. Apparently, um, there were talks back all the way back in like 2014, I think, to get a film made um, about um, the guy, um, William O'Neill and Fred Hampton. Um, and I think it was passed around from director to director and eventually settled on this. Um, there was also a funny story of one of the earlier drafts. Uh, Jaden Smith was in talks to play Daniel Kaluuya's character in this uh i i can't imagine that film so i'm glad that didn't get made uh, i don't think he's quite got the chops to pull off what kaluuya did with this but uh this this was quite a heavy hit film and and i knew it was going to be that before going into it um the screener thankfully was in the evening uh, when we did the london film festival films we had to pretty much watch films similar to this in the morning at like 9 a.m and it's you know, you know you roll out of bed and then you have to watch a really heavy two hour two and a half hour film but um, th this film goes places and I'd, I'd compare it actually to Black Klansman. I don't want to give too much away about it for people who don't know, although I guess we kind of gave the ending away at the beginning, but it's one of those films where it, it grounds itself back at the end and it shows that real life footage, interview footage, uh, information, what happened to these people afterwards. And that's the stuff that particularly hit me hard the most, uh, similar to Black Klansman, uh, where it does kind of snap it back to reality. And obviously with things that are going on in the world at the moment, also uh, still a very, very relevant film. Yeah, and I think that's a really big thing with not just this, but a lot of the more the recent films where we're getting these films finally being greenlit. Uh, we, we know full well in this industry that it's been a very racist industry for a long time. Production's not being greenlit, lack of black directors. And to be fair to, I'm not going to say the Academy because they've not proven anything really yet. Uh, Green Book. Um we're finally starting to see production companies buying into some of that talent. I think Ryan Cougar's producing this, 
And back in 2018, I mean, we love the Creed films. We've seen Fruitvale Station. We reviewed that years ago on the channel. Uh, after Black Panther, he helps get this film greenlit. And, and it goes back to that, you know, not to bring the politics into it, but it's that this film has been touted for years. People have had ideas about this for years, but it couldn't get greenlit until it was the guy that did Black Panther asked them to make this film. And it does make you sit there and think, and Trial of Chicago 7 is something we're definitely going to compare it to later on because it covers it, and it's this isn't an important moment in the Trial of Chicago 7, but how a character is sort of shown on screen, how he's performed, uh, everything about him from dialogue to ultimately the character fate uh, is so different, and it should be different because this is a biopic, but I think the, the main thing with this, and this is what's really strange, and maybe this is sort of the Oscar dynamics that I'm, I'm going to get, because I really do enjoy this film. I think this is a great film. I think this is easily, at the moment, from the ones I've seen, one of the favourites. Um, we haven't seen Nomadland yet, which at the moment seems like the, the, the bookie's main mm -hmm. bet to take it all. However, Daniel Kaluuya is phenomenal in this. Now, Get Out is a film I saw very late to the party, maybe like a year or a year and a half after. And I thought he was wonderful. I hadn't seen him in anything else. It was just before I saw Black Panther. So you can tell that's how late I was to the party for that. And after Get Out, okay, okay, this kid's going places. I say kids, he's a young, young breaking through actor. I think he went to drama school with John Boyega and, oh my God, uh, Letitia Wright. So yeah. it's very much that we, we're getting, I know this is a bit of a side tangent to the film, but we are sort of had this era where we've had all these uh, uh, private school posh boy actors and you still get them, nothing wrong with them. You're ready red mains and all those kinds. And you get some flummel actors, but we know full well that the sort of the working class actors from those sort of uh, council states, they're quite saying the uh, underprivileged, they're actors that have never really had that fair shot. And we're starting to slowly see a, a trajectory towards them being given chances. And I think, on a side point, I think Daniel Kluber, he was on Skins uh, for the yeah. UK people that know what that is. And But Get Out's really the breakthrough. And then you had Widows, which he was unbelievable in. Uh, he played one of the villains in that film. He was amazing. Black Panther, uh, he was okay. Uh, he was a very much a supporting character, very two-dimensional. And I believe he replaced John Boyega, who couldn't film it due to Last Jedi, which John Boyega said on record he helped recommend him because those two have known each other for many years. But this is the film straight away he's winning his Oscar for. Um, I'm quite happy to jump in and say that straight away. He's going to be nominated for best. They're, they're putting him forward as best supporting, which yeah. I it, it's a tricky one because it's the Oscar debacle of well, it's a Fred Hampton biopic, but the the story doesn't follow him as the focus. However, he arguably has as much or more screen time than Lakeith Stanfield, who is obviously playing William O'Neill, and it's that debate. But I, I think we need to lead this with the Daniel Clue discussion because he. He is amazing in this. Even going back to that first trailer that came out last year, when he's giving one of those speeches, you know, straight away, this film's going to hit differently. And he did that in, in such a way that when it gets to the ending of the film as well, uh, you, you do feel for him. But I think when you get those real-life clips of Fred Hampton and you see how Daniel Clue has played him as well, even physique, he looks quite bulky in Still scene. Of it, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you don't see it in the face, but when you get the body shots, it's like, whoa, like he's 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 actually got a bit ripped for it. And it's because he looks like him and he's he's playing it's the role and I thought he's wonderful as an instruction point. Yeah, no, um you talk about his body, I was like has lockdown been affecting us all? Like I'm getting to the same way <laughs> a little bit. Um but um no yeah he's like completely embodied this but then when you see the real life guy at the end he does look quite he looks like a big guy doesn't he so um it shows that he's like throwing himself into the role completely uh i actually saw i think the first place that i saw clue so i never watched skins i think that was one of the first things that he did but i did see him on tv originally back in 09 and he was in a comedy series that only went for two seasons then it was cancelled it was called psychoville it was from the makers of um the league of gentlemen it was like this dark comedy he played the character of tea leaf that's where i first remember him and then obviously since then he's just gone and you know he's up and coming star and now he's one of the most talked about actors in the business i would say at the moment and definitely going to be going for oscars for this one um i, I can see where you you're getting that whole like is he supporting is he lead because he is such a he delivers such a powerhouse performance in this and the film really is with him in the focus with him in the forefront he is the the black messiah in the title and i think that because he does deliver the best performance and you know just in terms of his energy and the way that he commands a crowd and the way that he delivers speeches he does stick out in your mind as the main actor in it but i guess he kind of isn't because you do have um uh Lakeith stanfield who's 
quite a tragic, uh, can we call him a hero? Um, it, it's really complex. And I think he does, I do think he gets overshadowed by Kalulia in the film, but that's not to take away from his performance because he does have the, you really see the breakdown of his character and the conflict that he's going through where he does believe in the cause and, you know, what Kaluuya's character is is speaking about. And as the film goes on, he gets more, and the more time that he spends with them, he, he sees more of what he's trying to do and believes in his cause. But he's also, you know, he's also being entrapped, really, by the FBI as well, because he knows the fate that would befall him if he got found out. Uh, there's talks of torture and what what's happened to rats and informants in the past. And he's trying to stay away from that with utter self-preservation. So, and I think he delivers that really well in his performance. You have the, um, the really emotional moments where he'll just be welling up when he's talking. And it's, uh, there are moments where, especially towards the end where I don't want to go too into spoilers, but where he's been tasked to assassinate and to kill, to poison essentially, uh, Daniel Kaluuya's character. And he's getting very emotional and he looks really out of place and he looks like he's about to cause a scene and no one draws reference to it. That was kind of one of my problems that I had with the ending with how they handled that. But in terms of his performance and just how the sort of like the camera lingers on him and you spend so much time with him and you see that conflict that he's going through. I thought that was done really well. Uh, Jesse Plemons as well, who obviously is the FBI guy who he, he goes to and divulges the information to. I thought he was brilliant in it as well. So I saw him in the uh, the Kaufman film. Uh, I forgot what it was called from a few months ago. Um, oh, God. Oh, the, uh, end of the effing world? No. Uh, it's it's the suicide one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, oh, God. The, I, I can't remember. I'm thinking of ending now. things. That's the That's one. That's it, yeah. And he's sort of like the main star in that. And I thought he was fantastic in that. So he's also becoming an actor that I'm sort of like paying closer attention to now with every project that he does because he gives it his all. Uh, there's not really a bad performance in this film, but I would definitely say that obviously Kaluuya head and shoulders above the rest in this film for me. Uh, I don't know who the other people are that are going to get nominated for supporting. I'm going to have to wait until, you know, the categories come out and everything. But I do think he has a fantastic chance of um, of taking that award this time. Deservedly so as well. He's brilliant. Yeah. And I think what's worth mentioning as well, very quickly, we don't normally pay attention to anything that's not really the Globes, Oscars or, or BAFTAs, especially for us guys being the main, the main three awards, I guess. The one that I always like, an Oscar that's never been put on the stage is the acting ensemble. I believe it's the Critics' Choice that does those. Uh, this was nominated for that. And, and I think ensemble casts are, are quite rare because what it relies on isn't just big name actors it doesn't rely on having one or two good leads. It, it, it's all about consistency, performances, and writing of the characters. And I think everyone in this film has a place in this. You mentioned Jesse Pemmons. If you want to ever cast anyone that can be, is he a nice guy? Is he a horrible guy? Is he a creep? He's. I'm not saying he's been typecast, but very much in his sort of, from what I've seen of him recently, he does get put in those those roles where you're not sure if you align with him or if you don't. And I think he always gives away that performance in him. And I think there's no different in this one. And then as well, we also get Martin Sheen playing Jade yeah. Gehuber. Um, Martin Sheen's great. We get small scenes, but again, it's that ensemble thing. And I don't know much about Jade Gehuber. It's not he's not really as big over here as he would be in the states with the history and whatnot. But it's if you want to have presence on screen when you've got someone that's you know, head of the FBI, you bring in someone like that. Who, who has obviously had history. I think West Wing's his most famous thing. He's been in Apocalypse Now, and they command presence with their screen time. And then when you have the actors acting alongside them, it just emphasizes everything else, but it kind of low-key builds the stakes up as well of really how important this thing is that this person's involved and they needed him to play this role. So I thought the whole cast were excellent. Uh, and as well, a shout-out to Dominique Fishback, who plays Fred Hampton's girlfriend, who uh, didn't know anything about in real life, uh, both the actress and the character. Because I'm aware of Fred Hampton. I think most people that have heard of it would have known it from the assassination or maybe Trial of Chicago 7, and you don't learn much about his life. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, we see the dawn of a relationship. We see him serving prison time. We ultimately see, obviously, what happens at the end. And then, as you mentioned earlier, when you get the real-life footage, the real-life factors, it does hit hard differently, especially when he you know, he was killed with an unborn son and his partner was was in the room, in the, in, in mm -hmm. the same flat where it takes place. I'm not going to spoil it any more than that, but uh, I thought she was phenomenal as a supporting actress, but to me, those two leads do do trumpet completely, but everyone's got their place, and and you feel for the characters, even minor characters that come in for a minute or two at a time, or 
they introduce someone new for five minutes and then something happens to them it's it's really fascinating i think that comes down to the writing and the directing that when they can play with your emotions like that when they can mm-hmm. write in a character so late on in a film and have a character resolution so quickly it gives you that credibility of okay that's hit differently because that's not what you'd expect yeah and um the bit at the end as well specifically like the assassination and the whole break in with like the police coming in at the end it's really grisly as well like it's yeah it's really really impactful uh it feels very realistic you know have the camera movements as well it's sort of like a sh- not complete shaky cam but it feels like you're in the room with them and the the injuries they sustain it's we, we talked about one uh before we went live and it's just really grisly and just horrible stuff um going back to martin sheen's character you mentioned i thought the makeup on him was fantastic uh if i didn't know that martin sheen was in that film maybe the voice he has got quite a, a distinctive voice i would say martin sheen so maybe i would have been able to pick it out but visually you wouldn't know it's him and there's a there's a moment uh where he's speaking to jesse Plemons's character and he's talking about um if they you know exist in a world where you know black people become more prominent like he's horrible horrible disgusting racism the thing that he's telling jesse Plemons and and that's the thing with Plemons, like I could never tell whether he was a good guy or a bad guy. Um, because at the start it seems like he was, you know, he he valued, he respected their cause, he was just sort of doing a job, you know, he made a lot of money from it, he had a nice place, nice apartment. Um, and then especially when he's in a conversation like that with Sheen, but then by the end, it's maybe he was a horrible person, or maybe he was just doing a job ultimately, but that's where the Judas part of the uh the title t- the title comes in, when essentially um uh, William O'Neill gets the blood money uh, and it's just like a, f- a few dollar notes here and it's like oh you've got a business now and and then we get into the real life stuff I don't know if we want to go into the real life stuff but it talks about that he only did one tv appearance uh, one tv interview this is William O'Neill and then it comes up with a particular impactful line where it says um, after that interview later that day he committed suicide which is mental the day, the, I, I didn't know anything about that yeah I know uh, that's what hit me the, the day it aired uh and it was on martin luther king day as well and he committed it it's it's quite horrid to read and i think i've I've read a little bit since this and he speaks of the guilt having to sort of follow a course that he he did believe in and then have to live with the fact that because he was essentially not black man into it but that he's he's got a past before he doesn't just choose to infiltrate when it's essentially prison or this and that's established in the opening few moments and because he's been forced this it's it's that I'm trying to think of it. I don't want to say the word tragedy. There are certain films like this where, you know, the, the title is a spoiler. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I guess I've not seen it, but the assassination of uh, Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford uh, is one <laughs> that we've spoken about a lot with Tom recently. Mm-hmm. It's that if I was to go into that, this sounds horrible. It's like Titanic syndrome, I call it. You know what's going to happen. And then you have a weighted expectation because they've allowed you to know the ending before you begin. And I'm not saying I want to see something gruesome. I'm not saying I want to see anything absurd. But because you know it's building up to a moment, you want that moment to be really horribly put well done. Mm -hmm. And by well done, that's not I want to see violence. I don't want to see that. You want to see the real life horrors done in a way that demonstrates how horrible it was in real life. Mm -hmm. That's why I've always called sort of Titanic syndrome. I think in this, when you've got to build it to a final scene, when the final scene hits you, it, it hits you hard. To, to, to the to the main scenes happening i'm not going to go into specifics of it but it's so well built up as well and you did mention the one criticism is the same thing you said there's one or two moments where lakeith stanfield can be very believable i don't know if that's the writings his performance is pretty much perfect so i'd imagine that might be more in the script and direction than that but I, I think lakeith stanfield's become a very very talented character actor very quickly and i think he's slowly going towards the leading man status before we went hit live, me and you were talking about films we've seen him in. Uh, I think most people know from Get Out, mm-hmm. Uncle Gems, uh, it, If Beale Street Could Talk. I think Tate's seen that. But there are loads of films he's been in, Knives Out, and every film he couldn't be more different. He has such a range. And I think this is going to be the film that starts elevating him towards the, the leading actor stuff, where he's going to get more lead roles in these films. And the same thing with Daniel Kluger as well. Get Out made him a leading man instantaneously, but before that he'd had supporting roles. And after, I guess, Black Panther, Sicario... I would say he's leading in this. Um, Widows as well. I, I think both of them are destined uh, for leading roles for the next few years. It's going to be really fascinating to see what else the pair of them get to do um, because it is a bit different. And I thought they both deserve it. I don't think, kind of on a small tangent, heading into some of our Oscar predictions, 
I don't think Nikki Stanfield's going to get nominated for Best Actor, no. but I do think, shadow of a doubt, Daniel Kaluuya will easily get it. And potentially Best Original Screenplay. I'm not sure of this. We, we and you have had an off-air debate, which should all come I was, I was thinking it'd be adapted, I, wouldn't it? Would this be adapted because of real-life events? It it depends if it's been a book or something before. Book, it's yeah. very tricky with biopics. We don't know, but I think writing-wise, this, this could be a contender. And I think this will certainly be nominated for best film as well uh, at the Academy. They've got ten Oscars. There is a ab- well, ten, ten nominees. There's no way this isn't a part of that. And, you know, we don't normally do videos with our Oscar predictions, but when we are now slowly entering Oscar season, uh, yeah. if anyone wants to know how crazy the last year has been, today is the one year anniversary of Parasite winning best film at the Oscars, uh, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> that, that was like the last event I can remember um, from last year. So, mm. yeah, it's. Um, I don't know if there's any other predictions you've got for the Oscars. It's it's very difficult doing these Oscar reviews, especially when they've not come out and we can't talk spoilers. Granted, the title's a spoiler. I think, yeah, um, I think, no, I think I'm pretty much on the money with you in terms of predictions. Um, I think that um, definitely Kaluuya for supporting actor. Um, either screenplay, whichever one that we fall on, whether it's original, adapted. Uh, I can't see it winning director because he is an up and coming. I think they tend to give that to someone who's more of a seasoned director. Not to take away from Shaka King's direction in this at all, but it is his first film. I, I, actually, has anyone been nominated on a first film? Directing the first uh, film, I'm not sure. Um, um, what's his name from Whiplash? I oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's 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 not uncommon, but I don't know if, uh, if if this will be it for best director. But I, I'm I'm very interested with his career as well. Now, and again, it's harping back to that he's had this idea. Ryan Coogler's helped him get it greenlit, and if he's now got the foundation of I directed Judas and the Black Messiah, he to me that should be enough for him to yeah. start to get other roles. And it's going to be interesting to see what he can do as well. Um, in terms of my overall opinions on this film, um, it is an important film. It, I think I can't see it being a film that I might go back to, though. And that's not a slight against the film, because I'm like that with quite a lot of films that hit me hard. Um, what's another? Detroit. Oh, my God, Detroit. Um, one of my favorite films that I saw that year. Um, terrifyingly good performances in that film. Really, really impactful. But I've only watched it once or maybe twice. I think absolute max. I've watched it twice. Um and you've got to be in the right headspace to watch a film like that. Yeah. You know, uh, I would say that, I mean, they're two very different things. It, it's weird to compare stuff like that, but Detroit really hit me hard and continues to hit me hard when I think about that moment at the end of that film. This one did too, but I don't know if this is a film that I'll rush back to. I'm glad that I watched it. Really good performances, but I don't know how much staying power it's got for me personally to come back to it and watch it a second time. Um, I don't know if you're in the same boat with it or if that's just me with it. Um, no, no, absolutely. It's it's one of those films where it's harder to go back to these sort of tough watching biopics. Uh, I think Detroit is the perfect example. That's still one of the the most tragically, what's the word, shunned Oscar films yeah. of, of my time because it came out in August, not February, um, because they wanted to and that wasn't enough. So, it's a film where I think this is a very well directed film, a very good film with fantastic performances, but it's going to be hard to go back to it. And I think that's more to do with those sort of period dramas that ha- tends to happen a lot to me. I don't tend to go back to them often. That's just the sort of it. You get so many of the ones as well. I think when it's situations like this, I like to read more on the real life stuff, those sort of documentaries they do on them is always worth checking out. But at the moment, right now, I wouldn't say I'd go back to this. However, when things shape up for the Oscars, if I need a second viewing, I don't mind doing it, but that being said, it's it's not going to be top of the priority list when there are politely put so many of us to get through, and yeah. also for sort of for the Keith Stanfield and Daniel Clear performances, there are other films of theirs which I would also jump back and see first, uh, which oh, I, yeah. I don't mean as an insult because they're both amazing in this, but um, for, for me, Widows and uh, Widows and Lives that would be the two I, I, I primarily jump to. Yeah, um, but I, nevertheless, I do think it is a film that people yeah. should see when it comes out, and you know, to give it a fair shake. Um, I think you said the twenty sixth, didn't you? Twenty sixth, twenty sixth here in the UK. Uh, this Friday, the twelfth in America. So it's getting a spread out release as Oscar films do, even though we're all at home. Apparently, it's too hard of a logic to release them all on the same day. And then we're going to get the Oscar nominations coming out in March time. So we'll see a little bit more. We'll have the Golden Globe winners announced before we get the Oscar nominees, which is ridiculous uh, in all mm-hmm. honesty. But uh, that being said, I don't know if, that's, if there's anything else to add to the conversation with this. I'll just wrap it up with my opinion that this is a fantastic film and this is very much worth watching. And as of tonight, the 
the 9th of February. Uh, this is the best 2021 release I've seen so far. <laughs> but I'm looking forward. There's only been three, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing the competition because this has set the standards for the next few months, what I'm going to be following it up with. Absolutely. Um, now, usually we would open it up to you guys to tell us what you think of Judas and the Black Messiah. And of course you can this Friday if you've seen it, or of course the 26th for the UK. Uh, so in the meantime, let us know which Oscar films you're looking forward to seeing. Uh, we are getting closer month by month to that Oscar season. And we will have a lot of film reviews. Now, granted, I think we've covered a, ma a good majority of them with London Film Festival, but nevertheless, there will still be a lot of films coming out. Uh, and also, you might see some early screeners as well. Uh, we've got our fingers crossed for some that we hope to get an early screener for, but it's nice to finally get some new movies coming out now. So as well as new movies when they come out sparingly uh, they are coming out though uh, we've also got a series of retro reviews which you can watch every single tuesday at 8 p.m gmt we've got one division on fridays at 8 p.m gmt as well um we're going through our weekly series on that we've got four weeks left on that it's really good fun discussing that if you're a fan of the marvel films um but honestly the easiest way to find us is on our social media and that way you can stay updated with all of the schedules and everything that we've got coming out um so that is on facebook at cinema savvy twitter at cinema underscore savvy and once again t public link in the description down below but uh for the rest of this week so we are pre-recording this on tuesday this will be going up well you'll be seeing it on wednesday obviously when it goes up so tomorrow thursday the 11th of feb uh we are hitting a milestone on the channel it is our thousandth video uh, which is immense four digits in now with our videos and we're going to do a special live stream for that one uh, We've got a lot of discussion points, but it's going to be a look back on the channel uh, Sort of a history some inside stories of everything that's gone on It's going to be a really good nice chill discussion and we hope you guys can join us for our celebration of our thousandth video It's going to be a lot of fun with that one. It'll be me George and obviously Tate on that one um, Yeah, so that'll do it for our review on Judas and the Black Messiah and until our next video. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching